Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your Source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast. This is episode 146 for the 16th of Nisan in a leap year. So we are in the second day of Pesach. Happy Pesach. And once again, I am pre-recording this episode, so I'm not recording it on Yom Tov. And I hope you're having a very nice Pesach so far. And so today's episode, we are still in the middle of chapter 41 of Likutei Amarim. And the theme of today's episode is this idea which is very popular nowadays, not only in Jewish circles, but pretty much all over the world, of becoming one with the universe. So we hear this a lot, whether it's in New Age circles, in meditation circles, in Eastern religions, in yogic practices, Many different religions talk about this idea of becoming one with the universe. Many people describe this feeling of being one with the universe at times when they feel very blissful, when they maybe have gone through a very emotional kind of experience or something very meaningful, when sometimes people, when they uh, witness like one of the great wonders of the world, people have experienced this feeling of being one with the universe. And so what we will learn about today is what this really means. What is this feeling of being one with the universe? And we'll learn that actually this is a Jewish idea, but in fact, Judaism actually takes this concept to the next level, to to a place that's even deeper than this, where in Judaism, we understand that not only is there this idea of being one with the universe, but the universe itself has a source. And that source is God. God created the universe. So when we really get to this level of total and utter unity to the highest level, we're not only just becoming one with all of the other creations here in this world. I mean, that's like one level, but an an even higher and deeper level than that is to actually achieve oneness with our creator, where we actually lose all sense of self at all. So it's not just about having our self become subsumed within the collective self of the world, but actually it becomes totally subsumed in its source, which is God. So to understand this a little bit more, if you've been following along the podcast so far, you'll recall that we have two souls as Jews. We have the animal soul, which is also sometimes called the animating soul or our animating life force. Sometimes it is called the vitalizing soul. This is the part of us that we really identify with as being our sense of self, our ego, our personality traits, our our likes, our desires, what makes us who we really are as individuals. But then we have this other soul, which is the godly soul. And this is a soul which has been given to us as a gift in our lifetime. And it's an interesting soul in the sense that it really is a part of God. And by virtue of it being a part of God, it doesn't have its own identity. Its true identity at the core is really one and the same with God. It's, it is a part of God. And so the true desire of this godly soul is to become unified with its source once again and to become totally nullified and subsumed in the source. So what we'll learn about is really one of the biggest purposes of our lives as Jews is actually to get in tune with this godly soul and to minimize the importance of our animal soul. Even though as we will learn and we have learned a little bit, there is a very big purpose of our animal soul. But in terms of consciousness and in terms of like where we really want to have our mindset, We really want to try to identify as much as possible with our godly soul. And when we identify as much as possible with our godly soul, we'll start to come to this recognition of, first of all, on one level, this idea that, you know, out there in the world, everybody refers to as being one with the universe, like our sense of individual self becomes really minimized and it actually can be a very refreshing feeling because we start to realize that we're not actually going through this life alone. We're actually, not only are we all in this together, but we really are all together. We really are all one and we all come from the same source. And this can be very liberating. It can be 
very emancipating in that kind of sense, very refreshing. And the next level of this is that we really start to feel this sense of self-abnegation and sense of surrender of the ego and where our entire lives become much more about having a, a consciousness of God and a gratitude towards God and having this God awareness all the time. And now another thing that we need to mention here, and this will also be addressed in the text, is that there we might feel a certain resistance to this idea. And this is a very human thing to feel resistance. Like we don't, people often, the biggest fear that people usually have is if anything, anything that involves losing control. Like people tend to fear public speaking. People tend to fear going on roller coasters flying, things like that. What do all these things have in common is the fear of losing control. And we are very, very attached to our egos. We're very attached to our sense of self. However, as we'll learn in today's episode, we while we might feel on a certain level attached to our sense of self and very resistant to this idea of losing ourselves, of, of surrendering our ego, of becoming one with the universe, becoming one with God, ultimately, our true desire is to self-abnegate in this way. Our true desire is to be subsumed in God in this way. We just aren't necessarily living with this awareness right now because our lives, our bodies have us in a very confused state. And so the goal of our life is to kind of try to rid ourselves of this conf confusion as best possible by really adopting practices, practices that can lead us to this awareness of who we truly are. An example that the Alter Rebbe gives to really demonstrate this is this idea of when a husband gives his wife a get, uh, like in a divorce. So in Jewish law, there's this idea of when a husband and wife want to get divorced, then the procedure for that is that the man needs to issue his wife a get and then she needs to accept the get. And there's this interesting thing where often this can seen, be seen in a very misogynistic kind of way, like it's up to the man. The man really needs to be the one that initiates the get. And if he refuses to give the get, then she's then the woman's stuck and she's stuck married to this horrible husband or whatever. But the interesting thing in Jewish law is that as much as he needs to give the get willingly of his own accord, if a man is not willing to give his wife a get, we are actually allowed and encouraged to go and do different things that will coerce this man into giving a get to his wife, like even to the extent of really torturing him and doing a lot of things that will really, really cause him a lot of pain. And so at first glance, this might seem really strange because like I thought the idea was that we, he has to give the get willingly, right? So if he if he has to give the get willingly, if beating him up and forcing him to give the get, how is it that he's giving the get willingly? And the answer to this is that in fact, he really deep down does want to give her the get. He wants to do the right thing. And it's, he just might not be conscious of, conscious of it at the time. And so sometimes we need to shake up this guy a little bit to get him to become aware of what he really and truly desires. And I think it's interesting that the Alter Rebbe brings up this parable of the man giving the get to his wife in the context of what we're going to be learning about, because in the context of the relationship between the godly soul and the body and the animal soul, often this is this parable is used in Hasidus in a similar way that there's sort of like this marriage that hap that happens. Like these, we have these two souls residing within us that are, are cohabiting inside of our lives but when really ultimately we get into this like godly consciousness there's a certain divorce that needs to happen so the godly soul is divorcing from the body from the animal soul and this divorce process just like in the context of the the husband and the wife sometimes it's not pleasant sometimes we don't want to divorce sometimes we feel very 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 attached to our physical bodies which in this case would be like our wives you know like we're very attached to the body very attached to our sense of self and ego and so while it might seem like we have a lot of resistance to it we have to remember that just like this man ultimately does want to do the right thing and give his wife a get ultimately we too do want to uh, surrender ourselves to God and we do want to separate from our physical bodies so with all of that being said I think that is enough for an intro and I think we should get right into the text and see how the altar of it explains all of this it's a little bit of a longer portion today because um, once again we are in a leap year and the way that the leap year 
sections are divided up are different than in a regular year. And so the portion that we're going to be learning today in a leap year, in a regular year, is actually divided up into three distinct portions. However, I do think these three distinct portions do fit together really nicely because they all do center around this idea of really realizing that our service of God is not just an individual kind of thing. It's not just about myself, me, and my relationship with God, but there's a much greater purpose here. And there's a much greater relationship that my soul has with my other fellow Jews, as well as with God and with, um, with tapping into this collectivity of all of our souls and ultimately with the ultimate collective soul, which is God. And so with that being said, let's get straight into the text. So for context, yesterday we ended off by talking about this idea of how we really ultimately need to try to cultivate this awareness of wanting to cleave to God, wanting to really, really unite with God. And so it sounds, it, it made it sound like it's a very individualistic experience having this relationship with God when we perform his mitzvahs and get into his Torah and everything. It's a very individualistic kind of thing. But now the altar rabbit begins today's section by quoting, a, by citing a quote from the Gemara from Brachos chapter 49b, which states, al yotzi adam atzmo min which literally means that a, per, a person should never separate himself from the collective, from the congregation. So in a simplistic meaning, this is this basic idea that in Judaism, we know that we're not meant to be aesthetics. We're not meant to be recluses, like uh, we're supposed to live in a community. There's an idea that a man especially needs to pray together with other men every day, ideally, ideally nine other men. Like Judaism is a very congregational community-based religion. We're not supposed to just like live out on an island. I mean, obviously there are exceptions. If you are, if you have spe special mission to live somewhere in isolation, that's okay. But on a, on a basic level, as a Jew, you really are supposed to live in a Jewish community amongst other Jews. But here, the altar is explaining this idea of not secluding yourself from other people in a deeper way. Meaning to say that on a spiritual, in the spiritual sense, that when we have our spiritual service, when we're connecting to God and we're serving God, we should have the intention of uniting and cleaving to God, who is the source of his godly soul. And this is the source of the souls of all Jews, which is the spirit of, God, of his mouth, which is called the Shechina. So the Shechina is a part of God, which is, it's... A little bit difficult to translate properly, but it comes from the word shochen because it comes from sh shochen means to dwell. So it's like the divine indwelling. It's like the divine presence. And so this divine indwelling, this divine presence, this is the source. This is like the part of God that God like brought down into the world so that he could dwell here in this world. And this is the source of all Jewish souls. And it's like the collective place of all Jewish souls. And this Shrina, this divine indwelling, becomes vested in all of the worlds in order to vitalize them and in order to bring them into existence. And this is what gives a person gives a person the influence to have the like this divine influence to be able to have the power of speech in this in the way that he speaks Torah or the power of action to do this mitzvah. And so basically every single time, so it's like the ultra rabbi is basically telling us where, where do we have this power? Where do we have this energy from for us to be able to learn Torah or to do mitzvahs and everything like that? All of this energy comes ultimately from the Shechina, if we trace it back to its root. And so when we really have this intention to unite with the Shechina, with this collective, this place, which is the collectivity of all Jewish souls, that's where it's to be found. That's the source of all Jewish souls. This occurs by virtue of the light of God being drawn down here below through the Torah and mitzvahs in which he is vested, in which God is vested. And so one should have the intention to draw down this light, this godly light, to the source of their soul and to the source of all the souls of all Jews to unite them. So this is where the becoming one, like the collective souls come in, as is explained further on. And the meaning of this unity will be explained later on as well. So now 
now that we have this understanding that basically what's happening when ideally when we are learning Torah and being involved in mitzvahs is that we're having this intention to draw down God, who is the source of all things, and draw down this God, God's light into our souls, which will ultimately translate into the collectivity of the of the Jewish souls. So it's it's sort of like bringing us to this awareness, ideally, of the unity of all things, the unity of our soul with the collectivity of the Jewish souls and the unity with God's souls. So through this, we can understand why it is that there's a certain custom to sit to recite before being involved in any mitzvahs, a, a phrase in Aramaic, which is Leshem Yehud Kudshav Rehu Ushrinte Beshem Kol Israel, which literally means for the sake of the unity of the Holy One, blessed be He. And his divine indwelling in the name of all of Israel. So now we can understand this on a deeper level that basically when we're doing mitzvahs and being involved in Torah, we're trying to unite these things. We're trying to unite God with his indwelling with the souls of all Jews. And now here there is a note in brackets where the altar Rebbe explains this on a little bit more of a deeper Kabbalistic level where he explains that through this also the Gvurus will become sweetened, the severities will become sweetened in the chasadim, in the kindnesses. So if you remember, this is something that we've been talking about a little bit here and there, this idea of that there's the two level, two sides in the energies and like the spiritual energies of the world. There's the side of the right and the side of the left. The side of the right is the side of chasad, which is this like flowing uh, kind of like extroversion, um, giving side. And then there's the side of Gvura, which is more severity and restraint kind of thing. And this is the side of Gvura. And so this, so through this idea of like really coming into the unity and un uniting all things, what happens is on this energetic level, the severity actually becomes sweetened through the chesed on its own. Like this happens like as kind of like a side effect. How does this happen? Because all of the midos, like all of the character traits, the attributes, the emotional attributes of God become un become united and become one through the revelation of the supernal will that becomes revealed below through the arousal from below, which is the revelation down here in being involved in Torah study and in mitzvahs, which is the will of God as is explained in Idra Rabba and in the Mishnat Chasadim in the Masechet Arich Anpin, chapter 4, that the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah come from the whiteness of the Arich Anpin, which is the supernal will, which is the source of the Chasadim. So these are some really deep Kabbalistic ideas. I don't want to get too sidetracked and get too into the weeds in explaining all of this, but on a really basic level, what this is saying here is that basically we know that there are there's there are different spiritual energies that make up the basis of all reality and we've talked about some of these before the spheros and things like that so the ultimate level of god's will like where does this fit in into like the global map of all things this is in a level which is called arich anpin which literally translates to mean long face and this is a level which is actually above all of the other spheros. It's above the levels of Chochmah and Bina and Das and all that stuff that we talked about before. But so this, because it's above all of those, it's kind of the source of all of them. Just like the will of God is the source of all of his other attributes is the way to really understand this. So what else is the will of God and how does how can we relate to it down here? We know, and we talked about this previously in Tanya, the will of God is really his commandments, his Torah and his mitzvahs. So when we involve ourselves in the Torah and mitzvahs of God down here, we're connecting with God's supernal will. And so when we connect with God's supernal will, then just like this, the when we like kind of like connect with the source of our soul, this connects us with the, the collectivity of all Jewish souls and like the divisiveness of all of us disappears. And we talked about this a little bit in uh, chapter Lamed Base, chapter 32, where the best way to come to a sense of loving your fellow Jew is really realizing that we all come from the same source. So similarly here too, when we tap into the supernal will, then all of the divided energies, which really really are ultimately encompassed in these two levels of the right and the left, the giving and the severity and the restraint, they, the, the difference between them becomes nullified and they actually become united. And we, 
actually start to realize the good in everything. And we start to realize how this side of severity, the side of restraints, the side of more harshness and that kind of thing and judgment is actually also good and becomes sweet because we realize that everything really comes from the same source. Okay, so now we get back into the regular text. So now the altar where says that nevertheless, in order for this intention to be true and authentic in one's heart, meaning that their heart, that their heart really desires truly and authentically for this supernal unity, there needs to be a great love for, of God in their heart for only God in an exclusive way to be to uh, do nachas like to to bring great pleasure to Him only to God and not for the sake of themselves. Not like there should not be any su uh, selfish motive here at all. And now here the altar of cites Ram Mahamna to explain this idea, the level of the love that a person needs to have in order to be at this level is that it needs to be like, and this is from, taken from chapter 10 of Ram Mahamna, where it says that he needs to be like a son who strives for the sake of his father and mother, whom he loves more than his own body and soul. So the altar rabbi here is really emphasizing the deep love that a person needs to cultivate in order to be at this level of having this intention of really coming to this place of unity with God. So this is addressing, so just to bring it back to the intro of bring it together and explain this a little bit better, this is addressing the fundamental resistance that a person might have to this idea where this all sounds nice and good that we want to unite with God, we want to make our intention be towards uniting with God and uniting our souls with the collectivity of all souls and everything. But the ultra is saying that in order to really do this authentically and have this authentic type of intention, it's it, it's not so simple. It's It requires a really great deal of love towards God and not just like a great deal of love towards God, but an exclusive love of God where it's like we only love God. We don't love anything else and we love God more than we love ourselves. So it's a really selfless kind of love and it's likened to where a son really loves their parents more than they love themselves. And so the basic question that can come up here is that if we're honest with ourselves, we, how many of us really have this level of love? How many of us can truly say that we love God more than we love ourselves? Like this sounds nice in theory, but this isn't practically the truth. And so the altar is addressing this reality. And he says that nevertheless, while this may not be consciously how we feel, a, every person should nevertheless habituate themselves to have this intention. Because even if it's not truly truth, it's not authentic truly authentic in your heart that you really desire this with your entire the entirety of your heart nevertheless there is a small measure of this desire within your heart because why because we've already talked about this idea that every single one of us has innately in our heart and every single jew we innately have a love in our heart for god to do everything that god wants to do anything that th that is the desire of the supernal will and and this unity is God's will. This so this is part of God's God's will. Meaning to say this unity that happens in the world of Atsilos, which is in this the highest world that we've discussed previously, that happens through this arousal from below, through the uniting of our godly souls and it becoming subsumed and encompassed in the light of God that is vested within the Torah and mitzvahs that a person is involved in and that they should become really, really one, like really united as we talked about before, because through this, the, we are able to unite also the source of the Torah and mitzvahs, which is God with the source of his godly soul, the person's godly soul, which is called the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah again is the source of all of our souls which are in the categories of Mamali Kalamin, fills all the worlds, and Sovev Kalamin, transcends all the worlds, as is explained deeper at length um, in another place. So the Ultra Rabbit doesn't really get into this too much, but uh, but he just mentions these two terms, Sovev Kalamin and Mamali Kalamin, transcends all the worlds and fills all the worlds, and how this relates to this idea of this unity that we're trying to achieve. So... To take a breather here for a moment, what the Altar Rabbi basically is teaching us is that, first of all, the goal is to set our intention on achieving this level of unity with our souls, with the collective souls of all Jews, which is ultimately the Shekhinah, the divine indwelling, which ultimately will unite with God himself. However, the Altar Rabbi acknowledges the true reality, the harsh reality, which th is that this level of intention, of having this type of intention, a prerequisite for this is to have such a sense of deep and overwhelming love of God where 
a person loves God more than they love themselves, where they they only love God. It's a monogamous type of love of God, exclusive love of God. And how many of us can truly say with true truth that this is our reality? This is not the human condition, and this is not really how we live. And the ultra acknowledges this, and he says, that's okay. And he says, nevertheless, we should still habituate ourselves to have this kind of intention. Why? Because deep down in truth, every single one of us has a godly soul that's embedded inside of our hearts. And this gives us a sense of innate love of God that we are born with at birth. So we actually do have this, and we actually do ultimately, our true desire is to do the will of God. And part of God's will, part of God's supernal will is to have this unity, is to have all these levels connect our our souls with the collectivity of all Jewish souls with the divine indwelling with God himself so since this is ultimately God's will and since ultimately every Jew wants to deep down perform God's will this is ultimately our will so when the more we habituate ourselves to have this intention this will get us more in tune to this will and it is there is something authentic to it even if it might not feel a hundred percent authentic on every level and so now the altar Rabbi says that so this unity of our soul of like our godly soul and to have it becoming compass in the light of god to become one with it this is something that every single jewish person truly does desire in true truth completely with their entire heart and in every jewish soul out of where does this come from this is from this innate love that is hidden within the recesses of every single Jewish person's heart to cleave to God and to not be separate from God and to not be like their own entity or uh, or God forbid to be different from God's unity and oneness in any way any which way even if this requires mysterious nefesh even this if this requires self-sacrifice meaning a sense of really literally sacrificing the sense of self of the ego. like what happens at the end of a person's life the altar says here at the end of 70 years thank god nowadays people live a lot longer than 70 years so i'm gonna up that to at the end of i'm not even gonna put a limit on it so you know at the end of a person's life that's when a person's godly soul really reunites with god so the altar basically is saying is that this is actually the true desire of every jewish soul is to unite with god to such an extent that they want to unite with God, even if it requires total sac sacrifice of the self to the point that their self expires. That it does not, and after that time, this is so the ultra is saying that this does happen after a person expires, where at that point, a person no longer has any bodily concerns at all. And, and rather, its thoughts are totally united and totally vested in the letters of the Torah and prayer, which are the words of God and its and his thoughts. And they become like totally unified. And this is why we see that the entire, what it is that the uh, the souls in Gan Eden, in heaven, so to speak, are involved with, is just in being involved in Torah study. Like they're not worried about paying bills. They're not worried about uh, taking a shower or any kind of like bodily concerns like that. It's, all of those things go away so once a person passes away they're kind of living in this more true reality of really realizing their priorities which is truly to be unified with god and this is explained in the gemara and the zohar the altar says and the altar says that it's, it's explained there in the gemara and the zohar that in in gun Eden, uh then what is it that the souls get enjoyment from? It's not out of physical pleasures and things like that, but rather it's out of their understanding and about their absorption in the light of God. And then now the altar says that this is why it is it was instituted that we should say in the beginning of the Baruch HaSah Shahar, this is the morning prayers that we say in the morning, before we start praying, we say this prayer, Elokai neshama shanatata bi torah hi so it's a whole prayer. So basically, what in short, what the point that the altar is bringing out here is it means, God, you imbued within me a soul, and you blew this soul within me. And then it goes on and it says, And in the future, you will take it away from me. And so what the altar is pointing out here is it says that this these things go together, that since it is God that gave us this soul, and here it's referring to the godly soul, and then since in the future you will take it away from me, thus from now on I'm going to live with this awareness and I'm going to give it over to you and, and return it to you and unite it with you in true unity. As it says, and here the altar cites to Hillam, chapter 25, verse 1, To you, God, I lift my soul. 
meaning through this of connecting my thoughts to your thoughts and my speech to your speech with the letters of the Torah and prayer. And specifically when we address God in the second person, like when we say, blessed are you and things like that, like we say, Baruch Hata, like blessed are you. That's like the beginning of every bracha that we say. So basically, so, and that, that's the end of the section. So basically just to summarize that last section is the altar of is really pointing out this idea that this, that there's the reason for us saying, when we say this prayer in the morning before our morning prayers, when we declare this awareness of the fact that God gave us this godly soul as like a present and God is in the future going to take it away from us. It's like really promoting this awareness that we should not take it for granted. This godly soul that we have within us is a gift to us by God. It's actually on temporary loan and eventually he's going to take it out of our bodies. So any part of us that identifies with this godly soul will come to this awareness of the facts that it's really God's. And when we realize that it's really God's, then we'll really want to realize that we want to orient orient ourselves towards him and to and that the godly soul really its true self is to be encompassed and within him and and to be united with him and not separate from him and really to not have a sense of separation of separate self of a separate self identity and so then this awareness will translate into every time we evolve ourselves in Torah study or in doing mitzvahs and things like that, we're really going to be trying to align our thoughts and our, our speech and every part of ourselves with God so that there really will be no difference and like really come to this like unity and this like resonance between our, our soul and God. So that is it for today. So it was a little bit longer today. And I hope that gave you a little bit of a deeper insight into this concept of becoming one with the universe and how we can now understand that it's more than becoming one with the, with the universe. Ultimately, what we want to try to do is become one with the creator of the universe. And that even this, if this might not feel so natural to us at first, it might go against our innate sense of self and ego and individuality there is a part of us deep within ourselves which was give, gifted to us by god or rather loaned to us by god which is our go godly soul that actually does want this and actually this is its striving and awareness even if we don't we are not totally aware of it at the time so that's it for today and we will continue tomorrow and i will speak to you then thanks for listening to the it is top podcast hosted by sarit switzer this podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Abraham Yitzchak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.